let us pray. Our mighty Father, we glorify your name. We thank you, Lord, because of your grace upon us. We thank you, Lord, because of your mighty hand. We thank you, Lord, for never leave us alone. We thank you, Lord, because of your abundant mercy. We thank you, Lord, because of your glory that is shining upon us. We thank you, Lord, because you do not look at us as just an ordinary human being, but you are looking at us as a vessel that you can use. That's why the, all the circumstances, that's what all the situation, that's what all what we are facing, that's what all what is facing us. Almighty Father, I set our thanks in Jesus' name. Father, we cannot count, we cannot see. If it is just an ordinary woman being, we will have been abandoned. If it is just our flesh, we will have fed up. We will have said, Where is the God of Elijah? The answer prayer. But because of your love upon us, because of your mercy upon us, Father, you keep us moving on. And you do not degrease us. Father, accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Father, we come all unto you today, Monday, O oh Lord. If there's anything in our life, O oh Lord, the world we know that we cannot even expose to the other people, but it is in our mind. We are struggling with it as a besetting sin. Father, we pray by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, you are going to forgive us in Jesus' name. Almighty Father, if there is anyone we do not know, O oh Lord, out of our ignorance, out of our, O oh Lord, God understand. We pray by the power in the blood of Jesus Christ, you are going to open our eyes to that way of holiness, and you will take flesh, selfishness out of our life in Jesus' name. Father, in all areas of our life, you are going to use us mightfully in Jesus' name. And your name is going to be glorified. Thank you, O oh Lord, because you are the Lord and answer prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's open our aim to M72. Uh, let us be encouraged to the... Uh... My hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other grounds is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand.
continue with our Bible reading. But before we read, shall we just have a moment of prayer? Father, we are asking that you will open our eyes of understanding as we read your word today. We are asking that relevant passages that really speak to our present needs and problems, spiritually and physically and materially, you will impress upon our hearts. Be with us, enlighten us, instruct us, teach us as we read together now. In Jesus' name, I pray. We'll continue with the reading now. The book of the prophet Isaiah. The book of the prophet Isaiah. Chapter 7. Chapter 7. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Reason, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. And his heart was moved, and the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shear Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of reason with Syria and of the son of Remaliah. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. And within threescore and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. Moreover the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come, from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt, and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they shall come and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys and in the holes of the rocks and upon all thorns and upon all bushes. In the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired, namely by them beyond the river by the king of Assyria, the head the hair of the feet, and it shall also consume the beard. And it shall come to pass in that day that a man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep. And it shall come to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall give, he shall eat butter. For butter and honey shall every one eat that is left in the land. And it shall come to pass in that day that every place shall be where there were a thousand vines and a thousand silverlings, it shall even be for briars and thorns. With arrows and with bows shall men come thither, because all the land shall become briars and thorns. And on all hills that shall be digged with the mattock, there shall not come thither the fear of briars and thorns, but it shall be for the sending forth of oxen the treading of lesser cattle. Chapter 8 
Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll, and write in it with a man's pen concerning Meher Shalal Ashbaz. And I took unto me faithful witnesses to record, Uriah the priest, and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah. And I went unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Meher Shalal Hashbaz. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, My father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. The Lord spake also unto me again, saying, For as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloah that go softly, and rejoice in reason and Remaliah's son, now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. And he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. And he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck. And the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces, and give ear, all ye of far countries. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for the signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God, for the living to the dead, to the law and to the testimony? they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And they shall pass through it, hardly bestead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves, and curse their king and their God, and look upward. And they shall look unto the earth, and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. You have just listened to the Bible reading. And we need to take whatever we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Will you all rise up, please? Talk to the Lord in prayer. You've seen a commandment, a warning, an example, an instruction to obey, a promise to claim. Pray for grace that you will do as you have learned in the word of God. In Jesus' name, we pray.
reminds me So remind me, remind me, the Lord. So remind me, remind me, the Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone from the retreat in Jesus' name. And I pray that all the blessings of total liberation will be permanent in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. And those who are coming for the first time today, you are coming from the retreat and you have got the blessings of the Lord. I pray that as you continue with us in fellowship, the blessings of God will keep on flowing in every life, every family, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer together before the study. Father, we thank you tonight for the Bible study. Thank you for your people. Thank you for the ministers. Thank you for all the members, all our leaders. Thank you for everyone present here. We're asking, O oh Lord, 
that your word will come straight by your anointing, by your spirit, into every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep us awake. Give us understanding. And let your spirit interpret and apply the word to every heart and to every hearer in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Tonight we are studying from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and we are reading from verse 14 studying all through to verse 22. Let's look at verse 14. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 14, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. It's very interesting and very instructive to understand that the Lord, through the apostle by the Spirit of God, is speaking to New Testament believers and is speaking to people today, speaking to you and speaking to me. And it may be surprising to you that in a civilized world and with the position in which we are in the world today, you don't see idols on the street, you don't see idols in many places, but then the Lord is still saying, Wherefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Obviously, he's talking to the church, and he calls us the beloved. He calls us the believers, the people who have turned away from the world, and they have turned unto the Lord. They have repented of their sins. They have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. A change has taken place in their lives, and now they are on their way to heaven, and the Lord is still saying, Wherefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. It's not just to leave idolatry alone, it says flee, which means it will come and confront you. Idolatry from the right, idolatry from the left, idolatry from the community will come and then it says you are not to stop there, you are not to meditate and think of them, you are not to interact with them, you are to take to your feet spiritually and run and flee from idolatry. Now, you might think such a study does not concern us. How will the Lord be telling us to flee from idolatry? I don't worship idol even before I came to know the Lord as my personal savior. I never worshiped idol. And so to tell me now we're studying something that says flee from idolatry. How about that? Well, you understand, in the New Testament, in the mind of God, idolatry doesn't always mean a stone or piece of wood that you place on ground, you pour oil on, and you are worshipping. When you have anything, whatever it is, when you have any idea, whatever it is, and when you have any opinion, anything of essence that you place before God, and beyond God and above God that becomes an idol. When you worship something, when you love something, when you give your mind and your heart to anything apart from God, that means that you are worshiping an idol. That thing you love above God, that thing you raise above God, that thing you, you, you bow down to in your mind and you submit to in your heart, apart from God, apart from the word of God, apart from the will of God, apart from the revelation of God, that becomes an idol. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, and we're looking at verse 5 and verse 6. Ephesians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 5. It says, but this ye know, that no monger, or unclean person, nor a covetous man, look at this, who is an idolater. A covetous man is an idolater. Somebody who has whatever it is, money, material things, he sets that in the heart and is pursuing that. He is pursuing that apart from the will of God. He is pursuing that apart from the revelation of God. He wants whatever it is by all means and is covetous. He wants that thing above the will of God, above the word of God. That is an idol that that person is pursuing. 
and he says she know that no monger, no unclean person and no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Then it says in verse 6, it says, let no man deceive you with vain words because that be, for because of these sins cometh the wrath of God because of covetousness, because of idolatry, because of setting something up in your heart, in your mind, and you're pursuing above God and beyond God and apart from God. It says, because of these sins cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. It tells us in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, looking at verse 21. Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 21, because that when the new God, they glorified him not as God, neither was thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And then in verse 22, he tells us, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Verse 23, verse 23 says, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Verse 24, in verse 24 it says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the laws of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, it says they changed the truth of God into a lie. Look at this now. And they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. It tells us what idolatry is when anyone worships the creature more than the creator, worships the creature above the creator, and he places anything created. When we say anything created, material things are created things. Human beings, men and women, are created things. And all the papers and everything people pursue, if they pursue them above God, and beyond God and apart from God that becomes idolatry because it says they worship and serve the creature more than the creator and that's the creator who is blessed forever and ever that's why we're looking at this today we're coming back now to first Corinthians chapter 10 and we're reading from verse 14 again the necessity of implicit faith in the living God. All those idols are dead gods. All those creatures are dead things. And if you exalt them, if you lift them up, if you worship them above and beyond, apart from the living God, you don't have your faith, implicit faith and total faith and the foundational faith in the living God. But it is necessary to forsake idols, necessary to flee from idols, and then to serve the living God, him and him alone. We're dividing the message to three parts today. Number one, the imperative of forsaking idolatry to serve God. It's an imperative. It's a commandment. It's something that God demands and it's a non-negotiable. It's imperative. It commands us. We flee from idolatry. Number one, the imperative of forsaking idolatry to serve God. Point number two, the inconsistency and filthiness of idolatry in serving God. It's inconsistent. You have the living God and then you have dead gods, idols, and you bring them together, you are bowing them to uh, the dead God on the left and to the living God on the right. That's inconsistent. That's not proper. And it is filthy. The inconsistency and filthiness of idolatry is serving God. Point number three, the impossibility of fellowship with idols while serving God. It's not possible. 
if you're serving God, believing God, if you claim to be saved, if you claim to be a child of God, if you claim that you are now in the kingdom of God and you're in the light, you cannot be in the light and in darkness at the same time. And you cannot be looking up and looking down at the same time. You cannot be going on two roads at the same time. You cannot serve the living God and the dead idols all together at the same time. The impossibility of fellowship with idols while serving the living, the, while serving God. Point number one now. Number one, let's come back to First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 14 first corinthians chapter 10 verse 14 where wherefore my beloved that means my beloved brethren that means children of god that means sons and daughters of god that means the pilgrims who are on their way to heaven my my dearly beloved flee from idolatry why it's like you see fire burning and then somebody says flee you say why because it will burn you because it will destroy you and because it will devastate every good thing in your life look at verse 7 in verse 7 it says neither be ye idolaters as were some of them as it is written the people sat down to eat and to drink and they rose up to play they were destroyed because of that look at verse 8 what goes along with uh, idol worship neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and they fed the one day three and twenty thousand it's that serious it's because of that seriousness it's because of that danger is because of that devastation is because of what happened to the people of the past that's why he's telling us today flee from idolatry he tells us in acts of the apostle chapter 7 verse 41 acts chapter 7 reading from verse 41 is reminding us now what happened to the people that came out of Egypt and they were in the wilderness and they, are making, they were making their way to the land of promise. Look at what happened. And they made a cow in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol. They made a cow and they offered sacrifice to that cow, an idol. And they rejoiced in the work of their own hands. Look at verse 42. Verse 42 says, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifice by the space of 40 years in the wilderness you remember them in the wilderness they drank miracle water and yet they worshiped idols they received manna from heaven and yet they worshiped idols the lord opened a way for them through the red sea and yet they worshiped idols and he conquered the Amalekites for them he did a lot of the of things for them in the wilderness and yet with all those blessings and yet with all the provision they worshiped idols and it says by the space of 40 years in the wilderness that's what they did and therefore the lord turned away from them that's why the commandment is coming to us now the imperative is coming to us flee idolatry in fact in chapter 15 of acts the Lord by the Spirit of God talking to the Gentile church and you see the leaders and the apostles and the preachers in the in the church and to one thing he told them in Acts chapter 15 reading from verse 20 how they must forsake idol how they must turn away from idol it says so put your Bible Acts chapter 15 verse 20 but that were right unto them and that they abstain from pollutions of idols. Idol pollutes. Idol will corrupt. Idol will defile you. Whether the idol is in the heart, 
or the idol is in the home or the idol is something you raise up in your mind above God and beyond God and beside God it brings pollution it brings defilement and it brings judgment in the sight of God and it says that you abstain from the pollutions of idols and from fornication and from strangled and from blood verse 28 in verse 28 for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost this is the word of the Holy Ghost and this is the revelation of the Holy Ghost and this is the commandment and the imperative the Holy Ghost is given to the church the church of the Gentiles and the church of every nation and the church of every generation and the church of every denomination that it seemed good unto the Holy Ghost and to us and to lay upon you no greater bodies than these necessary things this is necessary and what are those necessary things look at verse 29 in verse 29 that ye abstain from meats offered to idols that if you're a child of god if you're not born again and if you're your way to heaven if the holy spirit has done the work of grace in your heart and you say you are now a member of the family of god and you are worshiping god in spirit and in truth you abstain from all the things that are offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication from which if ye keep yourselves ye you shall do well you'll do well in jesus name and then it says fear ye well acts chapter 17 we're reading from verse 16 acts chapter 17 verse 16 now while paul waited for them at athens his spirit was touched in him when he saw the city only given to idolatry it was in the city and paul the apostle as was waiting for others to join him in his missionary team he saw that the city was given over completely to idolatry and because of that he began to bring the word to them the word of repentance and the word of reconciliation with god and the word of salvation and the word of eternal life and in the word of eternal life what did he tell them look at verse 30 in verse 30 he says and the times of this ignorance but wink at but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent remember he's addressing their idolatry he's addressing you know, they are worshiping the creature that is idols of their own creation idols that they made for themselves idols that they manufactured for themselves and then he's telling them you're full of superstition and you're full of tradition and you're full of idolatry but now the lord is willing to overlook the past if you will repent and turn away from that idolatry the times of this ignorance god ignorance god wink at but now commanded all men not only those people in athens not only those people in the greek world but all men everywhere they are now to repent why what if they did not repent what if they said they'll continue with their idolatry look at verse 31 in verse 31 because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead the lord jesus christ went to calvary he died for our sins because god is not willing that any should perish and now that he has died the opportunity is there for everyone to turn from idolatry to turn from their sin to turn from the works of darkness and to turn from every evil sin turning from sin and iniquity and transgression and then coming to the lord they believe on the lord jesus christ and then their sins will be forgiven their lives will turn around 
they will no more continue in the worship of idols and when the judgment day comes then they will escape it tells us in first corinthians chapter 6 reading from verse 9 first corinthians chapter 6 reading from verse 9 telling us why it's imperative and why it is compulsory why everyone will have to identify if there's any idol in your heart any idol in your life any idol in your family any idol in your pursuit that you will identify that idol and then push that idol away and run away and flee from idolatry this is the reason why in first corinthians chapter 6 reading from verse 9 it says know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of god don't you know don't you understand you're part of the kingdom of god the kingdom of grace and the kingdom of light and the kingdom of power and the kingdom that belongs to the lord and the son of god it's opposed to the kingdom of this world or the kingdom of the devil have you not heard that the unrighteous the sinner the transgressor and the one who remains in that unrighteousness shall not by any means enter inherit the kingdom of god what does that mean to be unrighteous what does that mean to be sinful what does that mean to miss the kingdom of god who are the people that will miss that kingdom it tells us neither fornicators no idolaters no adulterers no effeminate no abusers of themselves with mankind you see there he mentions the idol worshippers the idolaters and then he says in verse 10 in verse 10 no thieves no covetous no drunkards no revilers no extortioners none of them shall inherit the kingdom of god and since we know that the kingdom of god is everlasting is forever and ever and ever and we want to be in that kingdom of god we don't want to be on the other side with satan with the devil and his angels and that will be forever and ever too that's why since we know idolatry will send a person to that kingdom of the devil and kingdom of darkness and a place of suffering forever and ever that's why we flee idolatry at all times and in all ways it tells us in first john chapter 5 verse 21 first john chapter 5 verse 21 little children what it means is not talking to toddlers it's talking about children of god you're born again you're a baby in christ you're a child of god maybe you don't know much but you need to know as much as this little children those who have just come into the kingdom of god and of course all those who have come before little children keep yourselves from idols keep yourself let there be a spiritual distance between you and idolatry idol in any form whatever will take your heart away from god whatever you will take your attention away from god whatever will make you focus your attention on a sin and then you forsake god and abandon god it says you keep yourself away from such a sin revelation chapter 21 reading from verse 8 revelation chapter 21 we're reading from verse 8 it tells us but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and mongers and sorcerers and idolaters and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burned with fire and brimstone which is the second death that is the second separation from god 
the final separation from God and the eternal separation from God. Who are the people that will be separated from God for all eternity? Final, without any reverse. Final, without any possibility of reconciling with God again. And it is referred to as the second death. Death means separation. When your spirit is separated from the body, that's physical death. And when spiritually now, we are separated from God because somebody is not born again, that is spiritual death. And when somebody forever, eternally, irrevocably is separated from God, that is the second death, is the death of death. And now the people that will be separated from God for all eternity. Number one, the fearful. If I forsake that idolatry, I don't know what it will do to me. If I forsake that syncretic assembly where they are not worshipping God, they have said anytime you leave uh, this place, this is going to happen. And you are living a fearful life. You don't have a mind of your own and you can't decide this is the way to go and this is what I'm going to do. You know the will of God. You know the word of God. You know the calling of God upon your life. But you cannot do it because you are afraid of so and so. That so and so becomes an idol. You lift up that man, you lift up that woman, you lift up that whoever that person is, you lift him up above God. And because you're afraid of him, it's your idol. If you die in that condition, that will be second death. And then it says, murderers. Why do people murder? They murder because, you know, he wants that thing. Another person wants that thing. And because he wants that thing so much, that's why he goes to take up the life of the other fellow so that he can have the house or the land or the property or the money. Why? Because of idolatry. He so much exalts what he wants and what he desires that he wants it so much, that's an idol, that he destroys the life of another person. Then he says, or oh, the allmongers, he's talking, that's another word for adulterers, fornicators, and for the unclean people. And what's that? When somebody cherishes his body so much, and I want the pleasure of the body, I know it's illegitimate, I know it's unrighteous, I know it's sinful, I know it's unscriptural, but I want the pleasure of the flesh so much that I must commit uh, that sin, even if people will know eventually, but I want the pleasure so much, and then you go to commit that sin, what's that? You elevate and you exalt that pleasure of the of the flesh above any other consideration the pleasure of the flesh becomes an idol and then it says and sorcerers who are the sorcerers those are the witches and the wizards and why do they do what they do why did they do they bewitch anyone and why will they hurt the life of another person with occultic power well the reason is they want something and the gain they want to have as a result of using their sorcery, that gain becomes so much on them that they just must hurt another person with their witchcraft. That's idolatry because a witchcraft itself is idolatry and the desire for such a sin that you have to destroy another person, that thing you deserve becomes an idol. And then it says all liars now why would I tell a lie? If I ever told a lie, it means I want something. I'm protecting something. I'm preserving something. I'm protecting myself. I'm preserving myself. And self becomes so important that I have to tell my brother, I have to tell my sister, I have to tell my husband, I have to tell my wife a lie to protect self self becomes so big it must be protected and if i cannot find anything to protect that self except telling a lie then i have to tell the lie the self you're protecting with a lie 
the property you are getting with a lie, the position you are keeping with a lie, or any prestige you are keeping with a lie, that thing becomes an idol. That's why it says, don't you understand? And don't you know that the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the mongers and the sorcerers and all idolaters and all liars shall have their part with in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death what's the lord expecting the lord is expecting will come out of all those things if you're a christian you're a child of god anyone in christ is a new creature old things are passed away and behold all things are become new I pray that in your life, in my life, in our lives, in our families, in the church, we'll be new creatures, all of us, in Jesus' name. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're reading from verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're looking at verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? How could you strike a league, an agreement, fellowship, with idols if you are a child of God you are the temple of God and if you are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit abides in you and the Word of God abides in you it says what agreement has the temple of God with idols uh, uh, for ye are the temple of the living God as God has said I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. In verse 17, it says, Wherefore come out from among them? Wherefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Idolatry is unclean, immorality is unclean, defilement is unclean any transgression iniquity is unclean any walk of darkness is unclean and touch not the unclean thing and i will receive you it's not going to receive the sinner just as he is he must repent he must be washed in the blood of the lamb he must come out of that idolatry and then god has a welcoming hand a welcoming attitude and he says and i will receive you only then you become a child of god a son a daughter of god look at verse 18 in verse 18 and i will be a father unto you it's not a father to idolaters is not a father to idol worshippers. Is not a father to those who exalt the creature above the creator. It is when we turn away from idol worship. We turn away from transgression. We turn away from iniquity. That he will now become a father. And ye shall be sons and daughters unto him, says the Lord Almighty. I pray that this word of the Lord will bear fruit in every heart and we're not going to exalt any man, any woman, any material sin or money or whatever. We're go not going to exalt any sin above our God in Jesus' name. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you. How ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's Christianity. That's real conversion. That's, a, that's somebody who is a member of, a, of the kingdom of God. Turning to God from idols, any idol, internal idol, external idol, monetary idol, material idol, human idol, whatever. Turning from idols to serve the living and the true God. And then in verse 10, it says now in verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, 
whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. If you have not turned away from idols, every form of idol, if there is anything you cherish, anything you worship, anything you serve, anything you give your heart to, and that thing is so important, you cannot give up that thing and turn to God fully, wholeheartedly. You are not waiting for the coming of the Lord. You might talk about rapture. You might talk about the saints going home. And you might talk about the day of resurrection. You might talk about the second coming of the Lord. If you have not turned away,